Good morning and thank you for joining us. Today, I have the pleasure of sharing a virtual stage with our global development partner, Data Art, alongside OpenFin's co-founder and CTO, Chuck Dorr. In a recently published white paper, Data Art highlights key considerations that product owners and application stakeholders need to make in the process of transitioning to an integrated desktop user experience. And in today's webinar, we're going to dive a bit deeper into what it means to unbundle a monolithic app and turn it into a widgetized micro app experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand later this afternoon. We also have our chat and QA function available for you to ask our presenters questions throughout the presentation. We will be covering those towards the end of the presentation. I'll also place a link to the white paper uh, for download and contact details uh, should you want to reach out to the data our team directly. And with that, I am going to pass it over to you, Peter. Thank you, Mitra. Thank you, everybody, for joining. It's a pleasure to have you. Hopefully, this is going to be an interesting and uh, valuable event for you. Like Mitra just said, uh, what we want to cover today is <clears throat> how organizations might want to approach the, the transformation journey or transition journey from the as is state, which is many times a collection of monolithic applications on the desktop to something approximating the very enticing vision of uh, you know, what, one way you might wanna put it is a uh, uh, mobile phone or a mobile app like experience where your applications are seamlessly and intuitively connected with each other that are integrating, uh, interacting rather, uh, exchanging data and exchanging context and the workflows are uh, smooth and intuitive kind of like we're getting used to or have gotten used to very much on our consumer devices like our phones, our iPads and similar devices. So um, the beginning steps of this journey may be somewhat confusing for organizations. So what we try to do in the white paper and what we're gonna try to do today between Chuck and Oleg is break it down and unbundle and make it easier, more, um, more intuitive to understand what are the key decisions and decision paths, if you will, that organizations might wanna follow to get to a strategy and an executable plan that will take you from A to B. With that, uh, I want to turn it over to Chuck. Chuck, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so I'm going to cover just uh, three quick slides here, uh, really uh, talking about first, you know, um, you know, where where do we where are we going? What does the modern uh, integrated uh, financial desktop look like? Uh, talk a little bit more about the the current state of play that that uh, Peter. Uh, you know, pointed out, uh, you know, the, the fact that we all have sort of monolithic applications that are, uh, you know, uh, generation or generations old in, in some uh, instances. Uh, and then, you know, uh, through the, the OpenFin customer, uh, you know, uh, world, like, you know, what are some of the trends that OpenFin is seeing as people go on this journey to the, the modern financial desktop? So, you know, I always like to start with a picture that, uh, like this one, right? That really says, "Hey, you know, we we all know what a modern desktop is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be uh, a bunch of small apps. They're supposed to be beautiful, right? The user experience is supposed to be consumer grade user experience. Um, you know, the the, the days of uh, having days long uh, education sessions on how to use uh, something, uh, how to use a piece of software, are, are really behind us, right? We can't expect people to go to a, a week long training class." Uh, to figure out how to use an application. The applications have to be intuitive. Uh, they have to have help when help is needed. Uh, they have to have uh, all the right buttons in all the right places. Um, and they just need to be visually pleasing, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it's great for us to say, okay, you know, we, we all know where we're supposed to be going, right? But we're starting from, a, we're starting from this difficult place, right? So uh, next slide here. You know, this is, this is really where we're at today, right? This is a, a typical trading application. Right, it's built in a technology that's very hard to uh, make look good. Right, um, it's it's really like a, a vegematic style application. Right, you, you it slices, it dices, it washes your car. You're like you know Ron Popeil when you're looking at what this thing does. There's charting, there's uh, there's trading going on. I'm you know I, I, there's all kinds of data in here. Um, I've got integrated customer data. Right, and so you know because this thing is doing so many things, it's very hard to say, oh, okay, you know, this one component here uh, is, uh, is a best of breed component and we're gonna use that throughout the rest of the firm, right? So we've got to say, okay, and again, we don't have just one of these applications that make up a workflow, right? There's, there's probably like three or four or five of these applications that link together, you know, from pre-trade decision support to trade to post-trade, right? 
So, you know, when we when we talk about this journey from here, right, to that the the previous slide, the the beautiful integrated financial desktop, you know, like how how do we get there? What do we see people doing? So, uh, on the next slide, we've got a, a few things uh, that we see our customers doing on a regular basis, right? They're saying, hey, there's a bunch of different components, uh, you know, a bunch of different features within our monolithic applications that probably should be broken out into their own their own things, right? So, uh, you know, search. Uh, things like spotlight search across all the different applications. That's something we see people investing uh, time, energy, and thought into. Uh, notifications, you know, uh, having, uh, you know, having sort of time-based or event-based activities uh, kicked off and processed through a notification workflow, right? Again, and then as we break up these applications into micro apps, right? Now we actually need to be able to find those micro apps so that we can uh, wire them back up together to actually process a workflow, right? So we need to be able to discover the applications, uh, the, the micro apps. And then of course, we actually need to build the micro apps themselves, right? We've got to pull out our chart component. We've got to pull out our customer information tool. We've got to pull out the, you know, the, the, the company details page, right? And then we've got to basically, you know, be able to bring those things back together in a meaningful way, integrate them into uh, you know, what we're calling here the modern, uh, you know, the modern uh, integrated financial desktop. Now, it's complicated to go on this journey, right? Because the, the distance between where we're at and where we're going, uh, you know, can be, can be a great distance. So, you know, this is why we, you know, partner here with DataArt. Uh, they have a lot of experience uh, with these large transformation projects. Um, they've come up with a playbook, uh, you know, uh, with us to help guide you on this journey to break down that monolithic application, break down that problem into a bunch of smaller problems that then gets you to build back up uh, to achieve this target state. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Oleg, who's got a lot of the, the valuable content here about how we're gonna get there, how, uh, how data art uh, and OpenFin can help you get there. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, thank you. So. Uh, yes, uh, this is the most common case when many organizations who are starting their journey to integrate the desktops applications, uh, they are not starting from the blank sheet of paper. They already have products and applications that are being used by in internal users and external customers. However, when a company decides to transition to their, their products to integrate the desktops, uh, product and IT teams may not always know how to efficiently analyze and perform a transition to the target state with minimum investments and optimal time to market. They may have basic questions like, where do I start? What factors should I consider? What decisions should I make? How do I determine the scope of work and so on? So with that, um, uh, to address these challenges, which are quite common, uh, product and uh, engineering teams need some sort of a high level framework that will help them to make key product and technology decisions, correctly identify the scope of changes and be able to plan and execute a feasible transformation roadmap. So data art in collaboration with OpenFIN have created a white paper that outlines such frameworks. In this white paper, we suggest four key steps that you see on that slide. Uh, so let's now dive deeper a bit, a bit deeper into each of these steps. And uh, I will also refer to our uh, refer our audience to the white white paper itself. So the step one is to align on goals and objectives. In this white paper, we outline typical pain points and how they can be addressed uh, by integrated desktops. You can use these uh, starting points and then flesh it out based on your organizational specific context. For example, one of the most common pain points is lack of integration between legacy applications which forces users to transfer data between applications manually or perform so-called double keying. Integrated desktops such as OpenFIN provide such interoperability using a front-end message bus, resulting in a higher productivity 
and automated flows between applications. So other typical pain points may include costly and time consuming modernization of legacy applications, lack of data flows automation between existing applications, costly and lengthy onboarding of applications into enterprise environments. And this is especially a big issue for software product companies who target enterprise customers. It also could be slow and painful product uh, rollouts and upgrades. So once you identify these pain points, uh, you uh, have aligned you and stakeholders on what you are solving for. You can then link these pain points to your desired business outcomes. And example of these outcomes are faster product innovation, reduction of manual work, better user experience, faster application onboarding, and so on. So when you pass first step, you will have this alignment. And uh, as I said, you will flesh out your goals and objectives. Then at the second stage, uh, uh, it is second stage is understanding your existing application technology. At that step, we would recommend creating a catalog of applications uh, together with their respective technology stacks. So why is that important? Web applications, for example, are written with JavaScript frameworks and run in web browsers. They may require little or no changes to be enabled in integrated desktops. And when I'm saying enabled, just being integrated, right? This is because of Chromium web browser that is used by OpenFin to host any web-based application. This integration is you know, simple, relatively simple, the first step. But if your legacy application written with uh, pure desktop technology, such as Windows Forms, .NET, Java, Silverlight, then you need to decide on your integration strategy. You may require writing an adapter that will enable integration with OpenFIN, or you can decide to rewrite the monolithic desktop application as a modular JavaScript front end, and then get rid of uh, desktop installations and you know, legacy desktop application at all. You also should consider technology uh, for external applications that you will be integrated with. Such applications may or may not have integration APIs, JavaScript APIs, for example, Salesforce, Power BI uh, provide integration APIs. And most of custom legacy applications or products especially in finance, uh, do not provide. So by going through this stage, you will define, you will get more questions answered and your roadmap, uh, you know, will be become more defined. Then you go on step three, that is focused on defining scope of target uh, execution environment. So, what we see is a very often desktop, integrated desktop environment is not the only target environment. And um, most of products try to support both uh, web browser and desktop uh, environments. And many users also require responsive application behavior for mobile devices, right? So, if you are going to support more than one way of distributing your applications, your product roadmap must include specific UX design work and architecture work for each of these channels. Typically, the most comprehensive user experience uh, will be provided in integrated desktops. So this is core work environment for uh, users. Usually, limited functionality or reduced functionality uh, is delivered through the web browsers uh, just because of the UX limitations of web browsers, right? You don't want to uh, roll out the full scale composite application to, 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 to the web browser. You want to make integrated desktop your primary one. And read-only notifications, alerting and reporting views uh, most often delivered on mobile devices. So you should perform 
the analysis of functionality and user experience for each target channel. Uh, this has a di direct impact on amount of work, application architecture design work, and product roadmap. That is why this step is included as a separate step, and we believe it's uh, very important. So, and we hope that uh, we have shown how going through these three steps will help you to make key decisions and better understand your future product capabilities. On step four uh, is where you will need to perform a more detailed assessment of the future scope of work. It is focused mostly on key areas such as integration, security, user experience. Integrated desktops provide great user experience and they have powerful user layout management capabilities. They support multiple desktops and monitors and integration with other applications. But of course, your current application may require changes in order to leverage these uh, capabilities. For example, you may decide to refactor your application menu that you know happens in almost in each and every case. Uh, tweak the color scheme, implement integration with other another product or optimize your application to be less resource hungry. For example, consume less memory, right? Another popular decision or feature that is not supported as a rule by legacy application is uh, the separate search or uh, separate uh, alerting and notification um, uh, your, your views that were mentioned by Chuck. So at that step, you will be able to scope and prioritize these capabilities that are important for you. And um, we included all these considerations in white paper. You can use it as a foundation kind of feel for your um, more detailed uh, assessment. And in summary, this step, step four, is where product team will spend most of their time compared to other three uh, steps. And um, we also would like to just highlight uh, uh, some simple and proven best practices uh, to consider uh, during the transition. Integrated desktops allow you to roll out changes incrementally. As always, it is good approach to, to have incremental, incremental implementation versus big bang. And uh, we recommend to focus on most urgent needs and uh, implement changes that will deliver value to the business quickly. So legacy system, and this is one of the issues, uh, usually inherit a sizable amount of technical debt. Uh, we recommend uh, separating technical debt reduction from other business objectives. So whenever possible, focus on delivery of immediate business benefits, but at the same time, keep trans, uh, technical debt transparent and have strategy how to address it. Include this into your roadmap, right? And um, another one is whenever you are doing legacy transformation or a greenfield implementation, consider implementing so-called uh, micro application uh, architecture. So before we discuss what is micro applications, let's take a look at the what a monolithic application is. So as a rule, a monolith uh, contains one project where all front end code is written. It talks to the back end, uh, which is um, implemented using layered services or relatively monolithic services. Uh, so the main uh, kind of um, disadvantage of uh, monolithic uh, architecture is especially for sizable complex uh, applications is that new release requires full application redeployment. You cannot release and test only some of your application components and services. Uh, modular modular uh, micro applications in contrast 
uh, use uh, APIs or microservices on the backend and have UI components packaged in separate uh, micro modules so that each module uh, can be deployed and released independently from each other. And therefore you can start implementing uh, front-end layouts using you know, blue, green, blue, blue green deployments and it does not require full system redeployment uh, during the release. In proper uh, micro front-end application you, uh, architecture, you also have very good alignment between uh, front-end modules uh, and packages, micro applications, and uh, back-end microservices or API components, right? So it becomes the small deployable independent unit that acts as an application itself. So for example, when we go to uh, micro front end um, application concepts, let's say, you know, non-financial concept, right? Spotify, the search toolbar is a micro application and there is an entire team that is working on, on it. So this is very important when the volume of your uh, application growth with micro app approach, you are building reusable applications aligned with, usually aligned with business functions. For example, you can build one chatting component or notification component, search component that could be then reused by multiple applications. And it will be, as I said, released, updated independently from the rest of the apps. So, uh, the micro application approach uh, reduces complexity of development of developing large applications. It enables parallel development of application components by multiple teams and development. And you know, very often this leads to uh, faster pace of innovation, right? It ensures consistent UX because uh, you are reusing you know style and component modules and therefore between teams right and therefore UX becoming more consistent. Um, uh, as I said it enables sharing and reuse of um, UI components. Uh, it also and this is interesting enables uh, uh, the use of multiple JavaScript frameworks. Uh, in enterprises, you know, some teams prefer to use uh, Angular, some Agile. So integrated desktops allow you to combine uh, different technologies and therefore give more freedom uh, to these uh, implementation teams while you keep your architecture consistent. So as I said, it enables incremental application updates and make overall changes of the system uh, faster, safer, and more predictable. But of course you have to arrive to that state. It, it's not given, you know, from the day one, right? There is some work that significant work that should be done. So um, micro front end approach itself, and I'll just make a very high level overview of uh, architecture um, has some key features. Uh, uh, so there is this clear separation of styles, validation logic, and component code. So it kind of, you know, very often business logic and UI um, uh, logic it is mixed in the one module. So th this approach goes beyond the separation and it has more independent uh, levels of abstraction uh, or separation of concerns uh, wi within the architecture. It also has well-defined communication contracts between application components and REST microservices, and it, en it enables and interoperability and use of uh, micro-applications uh, across uh, desktop frameworks. So that concludes my high-level overview of the migration assessment framework and uh, micro application approach. If you would like to learn more, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we will be happy to schedule a deep dive uh, sessions with you. We can go deeper into technical details such as organization of uh, efficient um, 
project structure, uh, organization of uh, CI, CD process uh, for uh, building modern applications, choosing um, um, target uh, um, uh, JavaScript framework and, and so on. And now let's uh, watch a short video that shows an example of monolithic application transformation. Uh, it is published on website, but you know, uh, just one minute and a half. After that video, Chuck and myself will be happy to answer your questions. Let me just start this video now. Originally, this cryptocurrency trading solution was developed using Angular as a single-page monolithic application. The solution suffered from certain limitations that are typical for legacy web applications. For example, it was not possible to open multiple charts or to rearrange panels and organize a convenient workspace on the desktop, including a multi-monitor setup that is common for trading professionals. There was no integration and interoperability with other desktop applications. The look and feel was somewhat outdated and there was no way to reuse functional parts of the application as standalone UI modules. Using OpenFin, Datar transformed this monolith into a set of integrated micro applications that can also act as independently reusable widgets on a desktop. The transformed application provides a seamless, unified desktop user experience. It is now possible to organize a multi-window, multi-monitor workspace with snap and dock layout management functionality and multi-tab windows. These components function seamlessly together and share a common data and desktop events. This transformation project included design and implementation of components and the enablement of interoperability or data and context sharing using OpenFIN's FDC3 compliant protocol. In a matter of weeks, this legacy monolith was transformed into a modern micro front-end application capable of running both on the desktop and in a web browser. Thank you. M Mitra, Perfect. over to Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and it looks like we don't have any questions. We'll keep it open for about a minute or so. Um, and if anything, I have put some links in the chat for, to download the white paper. I've also added uh, a link to reach out to the data art team uh, should you want to schedule a follow-up. So uh, that, while we're waiting for people to stage in some questions, if, uh, if they have any, um, you know, there are a couple of things that I wanted to, you know, maybe highlight or cover here uh, that we see, you know, uh, when people, you know, take uh, this sort of application, uh, you know, journey from a, a monolithic application to, you know, a, a more modern setup, we often see people, uh, instead of doing sort of a big bang rewrite of something, uh, they'll often uh, stage uh, the delivery of, um, you know, they'll stage the delivery of the, the the modern bits. And, you know, again, instead of doing sort of like a, I'll go away for 12 months or 18 months and, and big bang rewrite something, uh, I'm going to start, you know, like start with a, a very visual component focused at a, at, at um, you know, a, a very visual component that's focused at a, you know, having a really good user experience, something like a charting tool or something like that, they'll, you know, deliver that first as a bolt on to the monolith. Uh, and then, you know, again, sort of block and tackle their way through the UI. Is that something that you guys see people doing? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true. And uh, when I said that proper prioritization has to be done, I, I, I would say that in general, when we are talking about monolithic applications, uh, there are two uh, distinct uh, cases, big cases of, uh, you know, buckets of, of that, that um, preceding that transformation. One is you have already uh, built uh, the huge monstrous uh, monolithic uh, application as you Chuck showed at your uh, screen, some sort of a trading application. So this is one challenge and uh, you may decide to 
uh, maybe start with separating out um, uh, the, the charting component. So you starting from uh, your transformation from making a micro application uh, of the component that is most frequently used or that should be opened on multiple monitors, right? So traders, for example, have, I don't know, some, uh you know watch list right that they want to you know pin to uh you know one monitor and uh uh you know hide the rest of, of the view right so they identify this functionality and uh you know it is prioritized as a you know high priority then uh another case is when you already have many small or smaller uh, monolithic applications, right? And in this case, let's say operational teams are dealing with, you know, 10 different up legacy applications and need to enter double key data in, in, you know, five of applications when they apply, you know, some changes to reference data to, or to something else, right? In this case, uh, you probably do not start from modifying legacy applications instead you uh, build a kind of a glue uh, using uh, integrated desktops that allows you to perform that automation and avoid double keying so to these applications you just implementing uh, javascript integration api so that you can enter data in one uh, place and then it flows to this other applications and you get in um, a kind of immediately, you know, a lot of, you know, it's basically uh, a, an alternative to RPA, right? <laughs> You're automating your, you know, business flows, uh, you're making users happy, you let them be focused on, you know, their, you know, major business functions. So this is another example how you prioritize your implementation differently you know based on your uh, current uh, context right perfect i am going to bring in one of our participants for a question give me one second Sudipta, if you'd like to join for your question, you're welcome to do so. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation so far. Uh, there are a couple of questions. It's not a single question. And uh, you feel free to answer them. You feel free not to answer them. You feel free to answer them per se. If uh, my audio as well as the speed of the speech is faster or slower in case you don't understand ask me to slow down so i can repeat the we question we can hear you well okay great uh, and and i'm understandable right because we are yes i'm an i'm indian <laughs> we we <laughs> yeah, hear we you. call we have all international crew here <laughs> yeah there though a couple of brief things uh, is very good that you touched upon is uh, you know microservices and uh, and and uh, something monolithic i mean we lived in a world of monolithic and probably long back 1989 professor Tom Tenenbaum wanted to move into uh, microkernel which is mimics uh, uh, operating system what finally linus rovalas took it and you know the history and all that. So, so we all appreciate, you know, why we need a microkernel or my, my, microservices type of architecture. Uh, and also, you touched up on another point. It's uh, that's uh, in, a, in, a, in a world of uh, object-oriented programming, we call it aspect-oriented programming, separating the concern mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, separating the concern particularly on the UX world, has done the best by the, by the folks uh, who worked on the screen, but not the folks who worked on the React or AngularJS. Whereas you, uh, 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 never mind if I'm telling you that you are a little bit biased on the JavaScript uh, than on the Spring Hibernate framework vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis. 
or or maybe few others. Uh, of course, I will not bring PHP or LAMP here. So, uh, aspect oriented and separating the concern, the Spring has done the best, and Spring also do, let you to do micro services architecture as well as design. So, is it intentionally you wanted to avoid and you wanted to emphasize on the JavaScript? Question one. Question two. Uh, my experience and all uh, it's pretty long uh, uh, my experience I'm, I'm actually you know having diverse experience and i'm stepping into the new world that is the financial world so qu question two is basically you haven't had for probably for certain reason anything specific to finance you 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 spoke about the architecture, monolithic, and mi microservices, but that's pretty much pretty much generic. Whatever I want to apply it, I would be able to apply it, minus the database. So, what is your take on that? One is a one is a key thing. Uh, Spring. Why can't I not do the thing on the? I'm not a Spring guy though. I have no. Fear. I'm not at all a UX guy at all. Uh, uh, so. Uh, but I'll I'll be interacting with you guys. I've actually taken a couple of notes of your uh, address and all that. So I would love to be in touch with uh, all of you. So my question one is basically Spring allows me to separate the aspect uh, that is the concern. And it does allow me to do the microservices. So why are we going for JavaScript? I actually don't personally, technically don't like JavaScript. It's too much dependency <laughs> on the... And I don't like even. Well, a, let's. Even, um, and, why don't we and, Why don't we jump in here and try to uh, try to address uh, some of these some of these questions, right? So, you know, in, and, in terms and the of, question yeah. uh, that that answer probably okay. We can make you know there are in the world if there is a question there are hardly three or four answers. So, a couple of answers with with my kind of you know, if I call myself senior, I know a couple of answers I can guess, but. What is that special that you want to do with the open fin, with the, with the financial world? Because I'm stepping into the financial world, uh, I, 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 and that company CU actually wanted me to uh, take up this call. So what is it that special I'll be talking to him about the finance? Because you said some more... Sure. You let, said, let me... You, let me you, um, you, said, you said in a monolithic environment, we... your, everything is basically in a single window. But you have, you have, then you have demonstrated you have broken it up into multiple windows, and sure. and, and and browser versus mobile browser. So that part is understandable. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So Dita, let let, or, let us uh, let us or, jump in here or, and, and start to answer some of these uh, some of these questions. So the the first one uh, is a little bit more uh, you know why why JavaScript why modern web right and there are some real secular trends. Uh, that are being driven from the consumer space that are that are really making web technologies the best of breed technology for building UI going forward, right? And that's really been proven out uh, over the last decade, right? You know, you go back 10 years ago, uh, you know, when OpenFin was founded, uh, and you know, I think the, the question of you know should we use web technologies to build uh, UI? Uh, you know that was a that was an un, you know that that question didn't necessarily have a hard answer yet. But I think the 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 push over time here uh, has been you know really to to solidify uh, HTML5 JavaScript as the way that people are building modern applications, right? Um, and then uh, and then you know in terms of like the the different kinds of frameworks that that people are using here, right? One of the one of the reasons why having a monolith, you know, ha breaking a monolithic application up into micro apps is really valuable is that it allows the different teams uh, their own autonomy to uh, select and use what they think are the best technologies. And again, because the, the the modern web is moving at such a fast pace, right? Again, driven by consumer technology uh, investment, um, you know, it allows us. Uh, as a as a as an industry, right? To just select the best of breed component for the particular thing that we're doing, right? Some uh, frameworks might be better for doing things like, uh, you know, uh, charting. Some things might be better for doing, uh, you know, uh, tabular views. You know, different uh, different frameworks are going to be valuable for for different things. Um, and so, you know, by having uh, smaller components, right, we can try out new things. So, you know, we tried out Vue for a, a project recently, 
right? View isn't, you know, the, the, the top two. I think it's like our, our view is it's the number three framework. Um, but, you know, again, there, you know, kind of as you were hinting at, there's nothing particularly financial about uh, what we're doing here. And so being able to leverage this best of breed stuff from the consumer world uh, is, uh, is really, really, it, it's the thing that we're, the thing that we're doing here. Um, on the data art yeah. side, if, if you guys have things to add, uh, and then yeah. we can pop yeah. into the Q&A questions. I was going to offer a very high level comment. Like we, yeah. we've all said, there's nothing particularly financial to what the technology brings to the table. It's not the technology, it's the use cases, right? So the financial desktop tends to be particularly cumbersome and complicated with the multiplicity of applications and windows that the finance professionals tend to have to manage. You know, we've all seen those six to eight monitor setups where, uh, uh, you know, in a particular role, you have to be tr physically, you know, with your eyesight tracking all of those things together, all of your different applications, blotter here, chart here, um, and it impacts productivity. So this interoperability on the financial desktop has a particularly strong business impact in terms of productivity and user right. experience. That, that, that's why. Right, and um, other industry examples would include insurance where agents are dealing with uh, different quote engines and uh, you know, have uh, you know, very busy desktops or uh, operational teams in enterprises, they are dealing with uh, also dozens uh, usually of applications and utilities that they have to orchestrate. And it's not easy to, for them just to arrange these applications across desktops, uh, you know, uh, look at, you know, uh, be, be aware about alerting, about monitoring. So I would say any user who is uh, dealing with uh, a dozen of applications during the, you know, workday is <laughs> is basically qualified for using uh, integrated desktops and on Spring framework versus Java. So JavaScript. So we usually use JavaScript for building uh, just front end pieces, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, very advanced uh, frameworks uh, designed for building comprehensive. You, UI, I would say React usually used for building more of a lightweight components, uh, viewer, Angular, you know, uh, more comprehensive applications and microservices. We have a you know great range of technologies. So I would say Spring uh, Java is still one of the most popular uh, frameworks for building microservices, and we usually. Uh, use it a lot, but uh, you know, recently we use a lot of uh, serverless um, uh, application frameworks, and you know, on AWS building, um, uh, you know, with Python with any basically language, uh, Lambda functions serving as uh, uh, microservices. Even uh, we we had to happen build uh, serverless streaming applications, right? So. Um, uh, I, I just want to say that um, Spring Framework is very often used uh, when we implement micro micro applications with, along with JavaScript. And, and Oleg, I think that actually that actually uh, hands us off right uh, nicely into the the first question. This is uh, I'll just read it out for everyone. I'm a little surprised by the recommendation to lift and shift wherever possible. Isn't that just locking you? into bad practices and making future changes more difficult, right? Um, and I think that, you know, like I, I know, you know, where possible we want to do as, as little work as, as we have to, right? To get to a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, componentized architecture, right? So I think when we're, when we're talking about uh, reusing and lifting and shifting, it really is about being efficient about how we deploy our resources, right? And focusing the, uh, you know, focusing the early deliverables of a project on, you know, meaningful business transformation, right? As opposed to uh, sort of technical exploration of, of, uh, of a brand new architecture. Now, you know, once we get componentized, right? We see that people are able to address the areas that they really want to make change on, um, you know, but, uh, you know, but having that as one of the primary goals tends to lengthen projects uh, and then put them at risk around, you know, sort of, you know, it, it basically adds execution risk uh, to the process. Are, mm -hmm. are those similar themes to what you see? Uh, yes, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, lift and shift 
never gives gives you a perfect solution. You're basically wrapping up your existing application in something more usable, but it accelerates uh, the learning curve, right? So usually integrated desktop considered by, you know, um, by, by product and enterprise teams as, uh, you know, something magical uh, and uh, they, or something more, more, you know, very complex, right? As soon as they see uh, simple practical outcomes uh, achieved by lift and shift, maybe by integrating, you know, Salesforce application into your application suite or, uh, wrapping up your, uh, you know, operational applications or Power BI into integrated desktop, they start seeing the benefits and uh, able to prioritize work. Uh, I would say more aligned with with business needs. The longer people, uh, you know, uh, on 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 journey of of design, the more risk you have not delivering business value and like losing faith into, <laughs> into the transformation. So that recommendation just given from, from that perspective, perspective, you have to consider the, the learning curve of entire team. Uh, so uh, you must be reading the questions uh, as they're coming in, right? Because you're, you're providing transitions here for me that are just too easy. Um, so the next the next question, there's you know, a compound two question, uh, Oleg, I'm going to throw the first one at you and then I'm going to take the second one. The first one is traders generally use more than one app uh, and sources of data for identifying an opportunity and uh, make a trade. Do you have use cases uh, which makes it possible to integrate multiple different apps? And if so, what are the basic prerequisites? And in your last answer, you talked about how people integrate Salesforce. What are the other things that you see? Uh, you know, as people are bringing together the constellation of different uh, best of breed products uh, for the desktop, what are some of the things that you guys are seeing? I think there is huge interest in integrating uh, embedded uh, analytics. Um, so uh, frameworks such as uh, Tableau, Power BI, and, and others allow you to develop uh, very quickly analytical uh, applications or visualizations and uh, deliver these visualizations. Uh, th these are very, th these are not real time visualizations, more of a reporting vi visualizations, but deliver these visualizations as embedded. So basically you can design very quickly without, you know, long implementation cycle, some convenient uh, view, dashboard, uh, panel, and uh, in, embed it into your existing application. So uh, this is quite a uh, popular case. Um, the second one, I, I, I would say, right, that, that would be my answer. So people and want look, more interactions with, with data and visualizations. Mm -hmm. and, and I would add to that without naming the customer, but there's a use case that we're dealing with right now where <clears throat> imagine an EMS or an OMS, um, we're not talking just visualizing some data as it's coming in, which is important. It's, it provides you know, food for thought and decision-making, sort of in, inputs for decision-making. But because we're talking about a message bus that sits behind this, that's actually grabbing the data, right? That data can be fed into, uh, let's say, uh, actionable widgets. So you can programmatically, let's say, let, let, let's say that the fact of the changes that's important for you as a trader is available liquidity on a particular venue, right? Um, let's say, you can programmatically set up an automated uh, automated trade using not only having the visualization sit in front of you on the screen, but you can uh, you can grab uh, certain aspects of that data and uh, essentially automate or semi-automate uh, the the actual the actual trade widgets, populating it with that data once certain threshold uh, values are, are are reached. For example, for 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 something like a liquidity, let's say you know a lot of an instrument that you're watching on your blotter, right? Begins to move in, in large volumes on a particular venue. You can, if you if you want to, you could do something like an automated trade uh, pre-population window that alerts you, not only alerts you through a visual, like a charting component, but it immediately um, semi-automates or automates that trade. You can, you can pre-set it up, right? So that liquidity goes over a certain threshold, you want your trade to go through. 
right? I, I'm not sure if I'm explaining it too well, but it, it's an actual use case right now in development for a particular customer. So I, I always talk about this stuff as like, imagine you had RPA that was durable and always worked, right? It's like, you know, when you're able to start linking these applications together, you know, using real, real technology, right? Uh, you know, uh, link them together in, in programmatic ways, but they're, they're still lightweight, right? It allows mm -hmm. you to have the sort of this, uh, the same, and in, in my view, a, a lower investment level than an RPA integration, right? But you end up with an outcome uh, that significantly surpasses what you would ever get out of, uh, out of something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, and the keyword is durable. It's not fragile. Uh, durable. Because it's not yeah. UI-based, it's data-based. <laughs> Exactly. So by RPA, exactly. you mean uh, robotic process automation, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So right, yeah, right, like right. U, UI, UI marionetting uh, type stuff. Yeah, right, we've I got see a few that. questions here. So uh, yeah, maybe we, yeah, maybe yeah, we I, can sort of power through and we're going yeah, to yeah, follow up with yeah. everyone. But I do want, there's some good questions here. Um, I do want to kind of try to hit them. So the, the second question in this in this block was about uh, performance of, uh, of things on OpenFin versus uh, in .NET or Java. Um, you know, uh, I always like to remind people that you can play first-person shooter games uh, in web browsers today, right? And so, if your UI performance is hot, you know, needs are higher than what a first-person shooter has, uh, then maybe it won't work, right? Uh, you know, the I'm a big space geek. I don't know if you guys see this is uh, this is Starship, uh, the the SpaceX Starship uh, here, um, but uh, for for uh, SpaceX's Crew Dragon module, so the 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 module that the the crew used to go to the International Space Station, the control surfaces that the astronauts use are HTML5 and JavaScript running on a Chromium container, right? So exact same technology stack that is OpenFin. And so that is uh, both mission critical, uh, human life sustaining, uh, you know, and a complex, uh, a, a complex UI, right? So these are proven technologies, right? Both from a performance uh, and a uh, resilient standpoint. Um, it is where all of the investment is going in the consumer space, and that investment vastly outstrips, uh, you know, the the investment that comes from professional finance, right? So these are these are truly technologies that are hardened, uh, both from a, a performance and a reliability standpoint. Um, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep pushing past that one uh, and uh, go into our next question, which was uh, about the demo application. Uh, is the scope of the OpenFIN application showed in the video more on the UI side? Because breaking the data component into separate microservices would take more than a few weeks. Uh, so I think they're, they're asking a little bit about the scope of that project. Uh, right, uh, you, you, you are right. That, that video showed decomposition of uh, UI part uh, only. Uh, we had, uh, more or less well-defined uh, backend uh, services already in, in place, and therefore focus was only on U UI. We didn't have a monolith on on the backend. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna take just one final question uh, here, uh, and then uh, hopefully give everyone some time uh, before their next Zoom call. Um, the the last question. Uh, here is what is the difference of runtime and upgrade management between OpenFIN and legacy desktop applications? Uh, for .NET desktop runtime is .NET framework, which uh, has to be installed beforehand. But with .NET Core, you can now ship the runtime with your application. So uh, this is pretty OpenFIN specific. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll take a swing at it, uh, which is that you know, in in the OpenFIN world, you define which runtime, you know, which version of OpenFIN your application runs on. Uh, and you define that on the server side. And when you want to, uh, you know, say upgrade from version, uh, you know, uh, 19 to version 20 of OpenFIN, you change a, a, a server side manifest file, right? And then the OpenFIN uh, infrastructure on the desktop will download that new runtime and run your application in it. And there's a whole bunch of tools that we have uh, built over the, the last few years, uh, the last decade really, uh, to make that process really, really seamless uh, for it to not require any administrative access on the machine um, and uh, for it to be, you know, monitorable, testable, and, and all that, right? So, uh, you know, where we started from uh, at OpenFIN from a deployment perspective was we said, okay, we at a minimum need to be as good as uh, click once uh, and uh, and Java Web Start, right? But again, for a modern web technology stack, uh, and we've achieved those goals. Uh, we're excited that uh, you know that, that .NET Core. 
uh, world has made things a little bit easier for applications that need to remain on that side of the fence. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the upgrade process in, in Open Finland um, is very, very seamless and it's driven, uh, it's driven from the server side. Um, there are some other questions that we have in the, in the backlog uh, here. We're gonna be reaching out to everyone uh, that's uh, asked questions and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, reached out with other comments uh, and make sure that your questions are getting answered uh, and we can have deeper sessions with anyone uh, who's interested in uh, this migration to uh, the integrated financial desktop. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mitra uh, for any other uh, elements here. Perfect. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Oleg and Peter, for joining us today. As mentioned, this recording will be av available on demand in about a couple of hours. We'll be sending out a link to everyone who's joined today. Um, and with that, this is a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.